warnings. Oh, yes. Content warnings. Accents. Um, frequent implied violence. Swears. All the swears. Chapter 29. Joshua and the Duchess and I stood on the wall over the great gate of the city and looked out over the army of Carrick's mercenaries. Oh, it was grim. They could have reached us by nightfall if they wanted to. All they had to do was keep marching past the outlying farms, but instead they paused at every one and set the fields to the torch. The daylight was fading, but burning wheat made thin, bright lines that winked out one by one as the farms burned to ash. I wiped my face. I was so angry I was crying. Spindle stood next to me, his arms on the blocky stones of the battlements. His face was the same as when he'd found Tibby's bracelet in the bakery. The gingerbread man hid his face in my hair. There was no point to it. That was the infuriating thing. Sure, the Carracks were going to try to kill us because they wanted our city, and that was pretty awful, but at least you could see why they were doing it. Burning the farms? That was just senseless destruction. We weren't going to get any supplies past their armies. It wasn't like they were burning the crops to keep us from getting them. They were pulling the wings off a fly. Because they could. The people were evacuated this morning, said the Duchess. The animals too. Every park in the city is crammed full of pigs and chickens and cows, and farmers yelling at each other. She sighed. At least we won't lose many lives to this, but... God's the waste. The army was close now. You could just make out individuals in the ragged lines marching towards us. There were a lot of them. Don't ask me how many there were. I can estimate a cup of flour or a tablespoon of baking powder, but armies aren't ingredients. There were a lot, compared to the pitiful number of men I'd seen drilling earlier. So, we're doomed, my gut said conversationally. Yep, said my brain. So long as we're clear. The great gate was closed, of course. All the gates in the walls of the city were closed and barred with iron portcullises, but the city didn't exactly stop there. The problem was having a walled city. The problem with having a walled city, pardon me. The problem with having a walled city is that it limits how big you can get. The current walls were actually the third or fourth set around the city in concentric rings like an onion. Unfortunately, previous generations had cannibalized those earlier walls for building material, so if we didn't hold them at the gate, we really didn't have much in the way of a fallback position. Outside the walls, however, it's not a sharp transition with city on one side and country on the other. There's a whole sort of town outside the gates, people driving their goods to the city to sell are hot and thirsty by the time they arrive, so somebody sets up a food and drink stand outside to meet them. Over time, the stand becomes a bona fide inn, and then somebody else sets up another food stand, and so on and so forth. And some people can't afford to live in town, and rather than set up in a place like Rat's Elbow, they opt to live just outside the city walls. And there are a lot of businesses that you really don't want inside the city, like the knackers and the tanners. The smells associated with leather making will make your nose try to crawl off your head. And of course, the knackers and the tanners need some place to live, and... Somebody sets another food stand up to sell to them, although most of them burned out their sinuses long ago and can't taste a thing. And you get the idea. We have half a mile worth of town along all the major roads into the city before you get to the walls at all. I expected the Carracks to burn that too. They didn't. Joshua shook his head when I asked. The fire will spread too quickly. He said they have to camp there and there's too much chance the old place will go up like a tinderbox. If they're fighting fires, they're not fighting us. He put a hand on his sword hilt. They know that there are probably still people in there. There are always people who won't listen to an evacuation order. But even if we had a dozen trained assassins hiding in the Naki yard, they'd still lose fewer people than if they turned the old place into an inferno. Do we have a dozen trained assassins? 
I asked hopefully. The spring green man had definitely soured me on the notion of assassins, but I was willing to change my opinion. No, said Joshua. Spindle coughed. We all looked at him and he stared up into the sky with his hands behind his back and said, Well, not assassins, exactly. Spindle, said the Duchess with weary amusement. What do you know that we don't? couple of the, the lads, said Spindle, out of the rat's nest, you know. We ain't like the army, not as such, but this is our city too. He scratched his chin. Heard that a couple of them went out the smugglers' tunnels. Slug wouldn't go, but one of my Benji and Leaky Pig did, and most of Crackhand's bully boys and all. The names of these people amazed me, said the Duchess. Really, the nobles are so unimaginative by comparison. I wonder if Leaky Pig would like a cabinet position. Don't know how much good it will do having them out there. Can't hurt, though, Spindle finished. It may help a great deal, said Joshua. Taking out a few individual fighters won't make much difference, but if they can make the carracks agitated... If they can get them jumping at shadows, I'd far rather face an army that didn't get a good night's sleep. If you get the chance, Spindle, said the Duchess, looking bemused, please extend the thanks of the crown to One-Eyed Benji and Crackhand and, well, everyone. I doubt they'd like public recognition. The stopping, said Joshua, leaning over the battlements. He was right. They had halted a few hundred yards from the gate. We could hear them in the distance, a hum of voices and jeers and laughter, not unlike the sounds of the city itself. Can't we do something? I asked. They're sitting right there. Joshua shook his head, out of our range. Know exactly what they're about. They'll set up camp, and Oberon must have told them we don't have the resources to lead a charge against them. We stood on the battlements while the sun went down behind the enemy. Rising smoke from the burning fields made black columns against the sunset. I turned away. I felt ancient, like I'd aged a lifetime standing there. The Mona who'd spent the afternoon putting jar lids onto sourdough starters seemed distant and young and innocent, and the Mona who found a dead girl on the bakery floor was some other person from some other life. <sighs> it's a strange way to feel when you're 14. I need to get back to the ovens, I said. I have a few more ideas, and we don't have very much time. And yes, that was an eyebrow. That was an eyebrow with an accent, because I'm that good. An accent eyebrow. <sighs> Chapter 30. When I got back to the palace kitchens, the blacksmiths weren't ready yet. Argonel was overseeing one of the shields full of hot coals, which hadn't been attached properly and had spilled down the cookie sheet. Sorry, wizard Mona, he said, waving an apprentice into position. I'd threatened to have the man responsible or swept, but I fear that it was me. Will I have up in an hour or less? It's all right, I said absently, reaching up to pat his arm. He had biceps bigger than my head. There's something I need to do first. I'd rather face an army that didn't get a good night's sleep. Hmm. I was nearly at the kitchen door when Harold, the guard, stepped out and pulled me aside. Wizard Mona. I was pretty sure that I was going to get really tired of being called Wizard Mona before this was over. Yes. He shifted his feet and said, Mona, Wizard Elgar's escaped. My head was still full of carracks and burning fields, and I started to say who, and then the bottom dropped out of my stomach because he was talking about the Spring Green Man. Escaped, I said faintly. Harold nodded. He may have had an ally on the inside. We haven't had time to smoke out all of Oberon's people yet. He shouldn't have been able to escape from a wizard prison by himself, but we've been so short-handed that we haven't been checking the cells as regularly as we should, and well, he's gone. My stomach seemed to be laying somewhere on the ground, several feet away. On the other side of the courtyard, the apprentices yelled, Hup! and the shield of coal swung, clanking on the chains. There was a hiss as coal splashed over the sides, and somebody cursed. "'It would be very foolish of him to come after you,' said Harold earnestly, putting a hand on my shoulder. "'He'll probably go over the walls and try and meet up with Oberon. It'll be suicide to try to get to you now.' 
He's not right, I said, remembering that voice giggling in the dark in the cellar under the bakery. It wasn't that Elgar was mad. Nacker and Molly was mad, and she'd never do anything like that. There was something else wrong with him. Some kind of terrible darkness. I, I don't know if he'll care that it's suicide. Harold didn't argue. I'll be guarding you, he said. You won't be left unattended for a minute. If he does attack, that should buy you time to do something magical in your own defense. I nearly laughed, or cried, or, or both. Magical in my own defense? What was I going to do? Bake an attack scone at him? Unless Harold managed to buy me two hours in an oven on medium heat, there wasn't a lot I could do without prep work. I didn't say any of it. It didn't matter if a hundred Spring Green men were after me. There were still thousands of Kareks outside the city, and they were coming in. I could do nothing about Elgar right now. I might be able to do something about them. In magic, creativity is as important as knowledge. Fine, I said to Harold. Fine. Come with me. Aunt Tabitha, I said, stepping into the kitchens, I need to make gingerbread and I need a bunch of cookie sheets. These were probably going to be the worst gingerbread men ever. You're supposed to let the dough rest for a couple of hours before you bake it, and I just didn't have time. But that was okay, because the worst gingerbread man ever is exactly what I wanted to make. Aunt Tabitha helped me bash the dough together. It was a big batch, double what we make when we do the cooking in the bakery, and that makes 40 or 50 cookies by itself. Oh yeah, it's on. I need like an evil hat. Spindle hunched up next to the fireplace, and my gingerbread man stood on the mantel and glared suspiciously down at the batch of dough I was making. Jenny ran back and forth, bringing spoons and flour and towels and anything else we needed. Harold stood by the door and looked so tough and professional and guardy that I wanted to cry. Cayenne in gingerbread? asked Aunt Tabitha mildly. Mona, are you sure? I'd had broken glass, so I didn't think it would hurt my hands, I said dumping most of the cayenne in and looking around for something worse. Oh, have we got any rat poison? Jenny found it, a big jar full of dusty-looking granules. She brought in the jar, looking proud and worried. Aunt Tabitha ran her hands over her face and said, Mona, nobody's going to eat them, I said. I hope. I need them. I need them to be bad. I dumped the rat poison into the mixing bowl. You know what you're doing, I suppose, said Aunt Tabitha, adding poison to her own batch. Not really, I said, and was surprised to find out that I was smiling. But we'll find out. The dough under my hands was bad. I could feel it. There was malice in it. It wanted to hurt people. I fed that as much as I could, pouring all my anger at the sight of the burning fields into it, and all my terror at the news that the Spring Green Man had escaped. By the time I was done, you wouldn't have had to worry about rat poison. The dough would try to choke you before you ever managed to swallow it. I really didn't like doing this. The thing about baking is that you're feeding people and it's nice. You make things that taste good and that make people happy to eat them. The very best thing about being a baker is watching somebody bite into a blueberry muffin or a fresh slice of sourdough dripping with butter and seeing them close their eyes and savour the taste. You are making their lives better. Just a tiny little bit. It is nearly impossible to be sad when eating a blueberry muffin. I'm pretty sure that's a scientific fact. Making cookies that were bad and horrible that no sane person would eat, well, it was like being an, an anti-baker. It was the opposite of what I was supposed to be doing. I gritted my teeth. I remembered the lines of burning wheat. Aunt Tabitha helped me slap out a big ball of dough on each cooking sheet and helped to roll it flat, but I was the one who cut each gingerbread shape. I didn't have a cookie cutter, so they were kind of irregular, but they had two arms and two legs each, and that was the important thing. They were also really big. 
for gingerbread men at any rate. It was one to a cookie sheet, about a foot wide and 18 inches tall. We ended up with 23. We slid them into the oven. The big palace ovens were perfect for this, because you could fit 23 cookie sheets inside without a problem. I took the scraps left over from cutting the cookies and threw them back into the mixing bowl. If the book was right, that dough should be linked to the cookies, and I was hoping that I could use the magic of sympathy to control the cookies through the dough. Well, that was half of it down. I turned to Spindle. Spindle, for this part, I'm going to need your help. Spindle slid down from the raised brick hearth and fired off a mocking salute. At your service, General Mona! Aunt Tabitha picked up the mixing and baking equipment and went off to the scullery to make sure that it got cleaned immediately and that nobody sampled rat poison by mistake. I leaned against the outside of the fireplace next to Spindle. Look, you know people, right? These people going out to harass the car their carracks tonight. Of course I do, said Spindle. Ran with some of them back in the day. No crack ends, boys. No one would do that. But some of the others. Do you know anybody who could take out a load of cookies? I asked, nodding to the ovens. They're going to be bad. I think I can make them smart enough to start harassing the characters. They aren't fighters, exactly. But they'll want to make mischief. Some of the ordinary gingerbread men get a little, you know, feisty sometimes. They'll tie your shoelaces together and stuff. But these are going to be so much worse. <laughs> I thought they could, oh, spook the horses and cut ropes and put rocks in people's beds. Put pepper in the flour and set fire to bed rolls. Steal their daggers and their socks. Put out their eyes while they're asleep. Let's not get carried away, Spindle. You ever try to fight without any eyes? No, and neither have you, so don't start. Anyway, I need somebody to take two sacks of cookies outside the walls and set them loose near the Carrick's camp. Spindle nodded. Right, I'll do it. No, no, you won't, I snapped. You could get killed. Can't you find somebody going out there, Wiggly Bob or whatever their names are, and have them do it? Well, they've all gone already, said Spindle, and it'd take hours to find somebody else and convince them. I know how to get out. I know the way through the knacker yard. They ain't going to catch me. Spindle, no. He folded his arms over his chest. <coughs> Look, Mona, I can do this. Let me do this. I ain't a wizard like you. I ain't a fighter. If the characters get through, I ain't going to be able to do much, but I'm real good at sneaking around. I'm not saying I could pick the sentry's pockets, because I probably can't and I wouldn't try, but I can get in close enough to set your little fingers loose. But this is maybe the only thing I'm going to do that will be any help. Let me do it. I probably should have said no. It was crazy to let him go sneaking around outside the walls, but... <sighs> he was right. And this wasn't that much more dangerous than sneaking into the castle, was it? He'd done that ten times as well as I had. I'd gotten st I got stuck in a loo. Besides, if he was outside the walls, at least Spindle wouldn't be in the crossfire if the Spring Green Man came for me. All right, I said heavily. You can take them. But be careful. If they kill you, I will never, never forgive you. Yeah, yeah. It took me ten minutes to make up a big batch of icing, and by the time I was done, the cookies were coming out of the oven. Aunt Tabitha emerged from the scullery, and Spindle acquired two burlap potato sacks by the simple expedient of dumping potatoes all over the pantry. You know we had leftover flour sacks, right? So now we've got potato sacks too. Jenny put her hand to her mouth and giggled. Oh, Cook will be mad as fire when he sees that. <laughs> we yanked cookie sheets from the oven and dropped them on the big wooden table. I hurriedly iced eyes and mouths onto each one. I gave them little fangs. They wouldn't be able to bite with them, but they seemed appropriate. When they were all treated with icing and had cooled a bit, I grabbed the ball of leftover dough and took a deep breath. Okay, cookies, listen up, I said. We've got a job to do. You're going to go out there and make a whole bunch of people miserable. Now get up, and I pushed magic and will into the ball of dough and threw it into the cookies. There was a long, 
long moment when nothing happened, when I pushed the magic even harder, screwing my face up, and I can't really explain this bit, sort of shoving with the inside of my head, and then one of the gingerbread men sat up. The kitchen filled with soft ripping sounds as the cookies pulled themselves free of their cookie sheets, sitting up and stretching and looking around. Okay, I said, here's what we're going to. One of the cookies picked up a mixing spoon and bashed the cookie next to it over the head. The cookie recoiled with a spray of crumbs and threw itself at its attacker, leaving one of its legs behind on the cookie sheet. Apparently the grease hadn't been done quite right on that one. Stop! I yelled, rushing forwards as the one-legged cookie hopped furiously after the spoon-wielding one. Stop! Stop! Other cookies charged into the fray. Some of them went for their neighbours while others started arming themselves with kitchen utensils. Two formed a temporary alliance and flipped up a cookie sheet as a makeshift barricade. I said stop. They weren't listening. There was a jar of walnuts at one end of the table and the two cookies behind the barricade broke into it and began pelting everyone indiscriminately with the contents. Spindle dove under the table. Harold drew his sword and waved it vaguely, apparently not sure on whether he should be defending me or running a rogue cookie through. Aunt Tabitha whipped a frying pan around and connected with a cookie that had a whisk in each hand and a homicidal expression on its icing face. This is horrible, I thought, sinking my fingers into the ball of gingerbread scraps. I've blown it. What was I thinking? I made evil bread, and it's not going to listen just because you asked nicely. I'll have to pull the magic out of all of them. What a waste of time and energy. Suddenly there was a loud banging. I looked up. Everybody looked up. My gingerbread man was standing in the middle of the table, clanging a spoon against a cookie sheet like a gong. I expected the bad cookies to pelt him with walnuts and was about to dive to his rescue. He was a quarter of their size and so stale when I realised that all the other cookies were staring at him. When he was sure he had everyone's attention, he set the spoon down and waved his arms, stomping back and forth and glaring. It's completely ridiculous, and I still don't quite believe it, but somehow he communicated with the other cookies. Now, don't get me wrong. Doe is not smart. It's not like they talk philosophy and spoke a language called cookies. Nevertheless, my gingerbread man somehow managed to convey something to the bad cookies. It was mostly mine and arm-waving, and, well, there was a lot of glaring, too. It went on for a minute or two while the bad cookies looked, in so much as cookies can, kind of embarrassed. The spoon wielder set down its spoon and helped the one-legged cookie pry its missing limb off the sheet, and the walnut throwers put the lid back on the jar and tried to pretend they hadn't done anything. Well, I'll be, said Aunt Tabitha. My gingerbread man finished his arm-waving, turned, bowed, and extended an arm in my direction. The bad cookies looked to me expectantly. I figured that was my cue. I cleared my throat. Right, um... Whew. Well, if you are all willing to climb into these sacks here, my friend Spindle is going to take you someplace where you can be as bad as you possibly can. There'll be a whole lot of people trying to sleep. I want you to make sure they get as little sleep as possible. Cut all the ropes, not every lace, and... and I trailed off. The cookies were grinning like wolves, if wolves were flat and golden brown and smelled vaguely of cayenne. It occurred to me that something made of rat poison and mischief was probably going to have better ideas about how to harass a sleeping army than a mere human baker. Do your worst, then, but not until you're released from the sack and Spindle gives you the go-ahead. That's an order. The cookies shifted their feet and looked, not at me, but at the stale gingerbread man, who shook a fist, or as much a fist as a gingerbread man can make, at them. Spindle climbed out from under the table, and with remarkably little fuss, the cookies climbed into the sacks. I had been afraid that they would make an untenably large pile, but they all laid flat and stacked together, so when Spindle slung the sacks over his shoulder, he looked like a tinker with a pack, rather than St. Nicholas doing his rounds at Yule. You're sure you can do this? I asked him worriedly. Spindle looked at the sacks, more than a little suspiciously. As long as they don't get any ideas. 
Without any prompting, my gingerbread man hopped, hopped onto the sack and climbed to Spindle's shoulder. He'll go with you, I said. If they get out of line, he'll take care of them. I hope that was true. I hope the cookie would keep Spindle safe, or Spindle would keep the cookie safe, or... Both of you stay safe, I said helplessly. Come back as soon as you've dropped them off, okay? It was full dark now, and Arganel was at the door of the kitchen. I could see the red glow of our outdoor oven reflected against the side of his face. It was time to make the columns. I'll be fine, said Spindle. I won't go anywhere near him. He switched the sacks to the other shoulder, then gave me a quick, awkward hug with one arm. See in a few hours, knock him dead, and went out through the pantry. Aunt Tabitha gave me a suspicious look, as if she knew what Spindle was planning, and very, very obviously decided not to ask about it, and looked away. I took a deep breath. I didn't have time to worry. There was too much else to be done. You're open away, it's my wizard Mona, said Arganel. Don't call me that, I said tiredly, and went to go build the city's defenders out of bread. <sighs> Significant tea. Chapter 31. The dough golems were going to be lumpy. There was really no getting around it. They were made up of a couple of hundred pounds of dough apiece, and what we wound up doing is throwing head-sized lumps of dough onto the big cookie sheets, creating bigger and bigger piles until we built a roughly man-shaped form. The end result was going to be absolutely flat on the backside, and I was already worried about how we were going to pry it off the cookie sheet. On top of the head dumped an entire bucket of warm oil down on the surface, but it was burning off. It was burning off fast. We would be lucky if oil was all that burned. You generally bake bread for about half an hour in the oven, maybe more or less, depending on the size of the loaf. A hotter oven cooks things faster, but there's a limit on it. You can't shove dough into a blazing inferno and expect to have baked bread in five minutes. What you'll get is a lump of raw dough with a burnt black shell. I had no idea how hot the outdoor oven was. Hotter than I'm used to, for sure. The blacksmiths were heating it like a forge. Arganel apologised to me twice about the fact that it wasn't hotter. Couldn't work good iron in this, he rumbled, holding a hand out over the coals. Bread's a little easier than iron, I said, hoping it was true. I was going to get charred black golems with raw hearts at this rate. Maybe that wouldn't matter, but... I gritted my teeth, stuck my left hand into the raging heat, and touched a fingertip to the golem's head. Don't burn. You don't want to burn. There's a lot of heat there, but just pass it through to the centre. You don't have to burn. There was a lot of dough to convince. When I pulled my hand out, my index finger was angry red. I stared at it vaguely, and Aunt Tapitha swung me around and jammed my hand directly into a bucket of water. God's teeth, Mona, are you trying to burn your fingers off? The water was so shockingly cold that I yelped. I pulled my hand out, and most of it was fine, except the fingertip. A big watery blister was already forming. I noticed vaguely that all the little tiny hairs of my arm had burned right off. I had to touch it, I said, cradling my hand. This isn't all one batch of dough. I can't talk to it at a distance like I did the gingerbread. It's not all one thing. I have to make it all one thing. She gave me a look of incomprehension, but Arganel nodded. Not a wizard, he said. Worked with a wizard smith once, though. He said the same thing. Always burning himself on alloys. You're not telling me. You're going to have to reach into the oven and burn yourself on every one of these things, said Aunt Tabitha, horrified. I could feel a hysterical laugh somewhere under my ribcage. I shoved it down. I needed Aunt Tabitha to trust me, or at least to not stop me. It's nothing compared to what the Carracks will do, I said, staring down at the blister. If they get through the walls... There's a, there was a long, long silence, broken by the hiss of coals and the steaming of too much dough baking too fast over too much heat. Right, honey's good for burns, said Aunt Tabitha grimly. I'll get the crock and some gauze, and try to remember, you're the only wizard they've got, and it won't do anyone any good if you hurt yourself too badly to work before the battle starts. Yes, Aunt Tabitha, I said meekly. 
It turned out I had to touch the golems twice. The first time I had to convince them not to burn, the second time I had to get them to stand up. Hansy or quick, said Arganel, putting one of his own on my shoulder. He had such ugly hands. Mine were going to be ugly too, after much more of this. I didn't matter. If I was alive to have scarred hands, I didn't care. The shields over the top of the cookie sheet were swung away. Under them, the bread had turned a lovely golden brown, actually, and risen a bit more. The resulting golem was about 12 feet long and maybe 2 feet thick. He was going to be an awfully skinny warrior. Up, I told the golem, fighting the urge to snatch my finger away from the heat. Get up. Get up. We need you to fight. Spiraling Shadows was right. It wasn't any harder to animate something that size than it was to animate the, the bad cookies. The problem wasn't getting it to live. The problem was keeping it together. It tore itself off the cookie sheet. The bottom had burned as black as char, despite the magic, and it left large rags of dough behind it. The holes made raw, white wounds in its back. Scrapers! I gasped to Arganel, my hands deep in the bucket of water, my burnt fingers throbbing furiously. We need to scrape it down. Some, somehow, he nodded. We'll take care of it. You take care of him. The golem was swaying unsteadily on the far end of the cookie sheet. It was huge, taller than a one-story house, and it looked ridiculously thin and wobbly. Could it hit the enemy? Would it break apart if it tried? How stupid were we to think of fighting the Carrax with something made out of bread dough? It took a step forward and tottered. Oh, gods! Oh, gods, I didn't think about the feet. They're gingerbread men's feet. How is he going to stay upright? I dropped the bucket and lunged for the golem. It didn't have expressions, but I could feel bewilderment through the magic between us. The feet were indeed the problem, or rather, the lack of them. Our gingerbread man can balance on the ends of their legs because they're so small and nimble. The bread golem was about as far from nimble as you can get. Its legs were uneven lumps, same as the rest of it, and if it tried to walk on them, it was going to fall forwards on its face. Hold still, I told it. Don't fall. Um, lean against that wall. We'll figure something out. The cookie slumped against the wall. It was gigantic. It had arms like flattened tree trunks. It was completely useless if I couldn't get it walking and on the way to the gate. Arganel and Aunt Tabitha came up behind me. We were joined by a skinny apprentice with no eyebrows. All of us stared at the gingerbread man. I thought I might cry. My brilliant idea, and all these people working so hard on it, the stupid thing couldn't even walk. What kind of wizard was I anyway? And I couldn't just bake him with more dough at the feet, because dough doesn't work that way. If you pile up cookie dough, you get wider cookies, not taller ones. Gingerbread men are all kind of flat when you look at them. The base, said the eyebrowless apprentice suddenly. If he had a broader base to walk on, it wouldn't matter. We could strap some kind of plates to his legs, maybe. Of course, he needs shoes, the poor thing, said Tabitha. Arganel, the blacksmith nodded, I think, barrels. If he can step into a barrel for each foot, we'll pack it with straw and lash it onto his legs with harness leather. Do you think it'll work? I was looking at the strange, thin, gangly golem. I thought it would be more warlike. Arganel paused in between waving apprentices towards the barrels. Where's... Mona, I think if I was the enemy and a giant man made of bread came at me, even one as strange as that, I would think twice. Harold, who had been standing a little ways back and scanning the scene with wary eyes, stepped forwards. A soldier's strength is limited, Mona. If they have to act their way through your bread dough army, that strength they won't have to use on our men. I sighed. They were right. It wasn't enough. I'd hoped deep down that my bread dough men would completely turn the tide, that maybe if I raised enough golems they'd stomp the enemy flat, and none of our troops would get so much as a hangnail. Instead, I had one golem who could barely stand up. How many more was I going to be able to bake before dawn? There was only one way to find out. When the next golem was baking, I went back to the first. I suppose I had some notion that he might be panicking. He was blind and couldn't stand upright on his own. But I really shouldn't have worried. Bread doesn't panic. You can throw bread off a cliff and it will fall without a care in the world. 
It doesn't have nerves. The golem had been told to lean against the wall, and it was prepared to lean against the wall forever, if necessary. It really wasn't worried. The apprentices, who were wrestling barrels under the ends of its legs, they were a bit more worried. I darted forwards, put a hand as high up on the golem's leg as I could reach. Lift your foot so they can slide your new shoe on. It lifted a very large foot. Whoa! Aunt Tabitha stood on top of a ladder with a mixing bowl full of buttercream frosting. I grabbed for the bottom of the ladder, which had shuddered when the foot it was leaning against moved. Aunt Tabitha, just a minute, Mona dear, I just have to give the poor little fellow eyes. I held the ladder while the apprentices packed straw furiously into barrels, and my aunt leaned out across the expanse of baked face. When she finally stopped slathering, the bread golem had small, frosting eyes and a vague, goofy smile. Did you have to make him smile, Aunt Tabitha? I asked. I thought it might make him look more friendly. He's supposed to be trampling Carrick's mercenaries. Fine. She sighed, took another handful of icing and drew slanted, angry eyebrows. Happy? Not even a little. The eyebrowless apprentice took the ladder. He had a blister on the side of his face, probably from an encounter with the oven. I glanced down at my burned finger and couldn't resist rubbing another fingertip over it and making the fluid in the blister squish from side to side. Oh, like you've never done that. It hurt. I suspected it was going to hurt a lot more before the night was full. By midnight, two more golems were leaning against the wall and I had a blister on my middle finger to match the one on my first. But the barrels worked. When I asked the first golem to march up and down the courtyard, it did. It had a ten-foot stride and splintered a horse trough without even noticing. I started to feel a little bit more optimistic about its chances. The strain of keeping the golems going wasn't too bad. I've animated dozens of gingerbread men at a time, and three golems wasn't much. What was really wearing on me were my bad cookie saboteurs out there in the dark. Twenty-three smart cookies was a lot to keep going. It wasn't exactly that I had to do anything, but I could feel my energy draining away a little at a time. My muscles were a little more tired than they should have been, and when I stood up, my knees were a little bit wobbly. It felt like I was doing everything while carrying a 20-pound pack on my back, and it hadn't seemed a lot heavy at first, but we were a few hours in now, and it was really starting to weigh on me. With the fourth golem baking and the second and third being fitted for their barrels, Aunt Tabitha dragged me into the kitchen. Eat, she said, shoving ham and pickles in front of me. I'm glad it wasn't a sandwich. I don't think I could have faced bread right then. Unexpectedly, the magical weight on me lessened a fraction. It took me a moment to realize that one of the bad cookies must have been destroyed. I frowned into my pickle. I'd been planning on pulling the magic out of them when all this was done. Those things were way too dangerous to be allowed to run around loose. But I still didn't like the thought that some carracks had wrecked one of my cookies. I hope he hadn't tried to eat it. They were the enemy and all, but there were limits. I mean, I felt like having people eat rat poison cookies went against everything being a baker stood for. I'd gotten halfway through the ham when another cookie went out. Then two. The bowl of bad gingerbread scraps was still on the mantelpiece. I took it down and stuck my fingers in it. What's going on out there? I didn't get anything clear. There was a spatter of images inside my head. Flick, flick, flick. It was like the experiment back when I tried to listen through the scone. Except that there were pictures this time, because the gingerbread men have eyes. They went stuttering by too fast to make anything out. I smelled fire and heard men shouting, and felt the malicious satisfaction of a rat-poisoned cookie who had just done something wicked. I think one of them was running through grass, and another one was dumping gravel into a shoe. One of them was surrounded by legs and was running between boxes, and then somebody was roaring and there was a frying pan the size of a wagon wheel coming at me, and I dropped the gingerbread ball. A few seconds later, I lost another cookie, probably the one smacked with a frying pan. I hoped it had managed to do some damage in the kitchen tent beforehand. Mona, Aunt Tabitha looked at me. You're white as a sheet, girl. What's the matter? My head was throbbing, too. Using gingerbread men as spies was never going to catch on if I tried to do that for very long. I'd, if I tried to do that for very long, I'd have to lie down with a cold rag over my eyes. Seeing the world through frosting is hard. Nothing, I said hoarsely. I washed my hands before finishing off my pickles. Nothing I can do about it anyway. Time to go raise the next column. Through the rest of that long, long night, 
I could only remember two coherent thoughts. The first was this, that I was so tired that if the Carex breached the walls and killed us all, there was a very good chance that I would sleep through it. The second wasn't so much a thought as a question, and it repeated itself every time I had a breath to spare. Where's Spindle? And we'll leave it there for tonight.